All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so it's my great honor and privilege to be up here speaking at this amazing symposium. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Jaden Stieg of Big Psych, uh, for hosting this amazing event for the community. Your uh, flexibility and resiliency during this process has just been inspiring, and I'm so happy to be able to um, help with this conference and to be able to host this panel today. Um, it's refreshing to see a psychedelic conference like this that's really focused on the community and the average experience of the everyday user rather than the ones that I'm used to as an academic, which is mostly focused on the science and the clinical perspective, so this is really refreshing to see. Um, so my name is Jessica Nielsen. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. I'm also a principal investigator for the first psilocybin clinical trial happening at the University of Minnesota. We're currently recruiting. Um, so if you're interested to learn more, there's a table out in the vendor booth with some um, recruitment flyers and cards. Um, so this panel presentation will cover the scientific and clinical perspectives of psychedelic research within the academic setting. I'm joined today by, by two physicians, a psychiatrist conducting psilocybin clinical research at the University of Minnesota with, with me, Dr. Renji Varghese, and an environmental occupational health physician running a ketamine clinic in the Twin Cities, Dr. Manoj Dos. So due to the rescheduling of events, um, my other panelists who are going to provide both the graduate student and the research participant perspective were unable to join us. Um, so we'll just have a dialogue between the three of us to get the ball rolling. We have a set of questions that um, I'm going to be asking our um, esteemed panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So I'll start with you, Dr. Or Renji or Dr. Varghese. Okay, Renji. Um, can you talk about some of the safety aspects? Um, and what are the, some of the safety implications of psilocybin, including their physiological, psychological safety and their potential for abuse? Jessica, again, thank you for inviting me for this panel and thank you for the organizers for, for doing this. Um, so safety, when I think of safety of uh, psilocybin, um, I think of three main things, physiologic safety, um, the concerns for dependence, and then psychological safety. So physiologically, psilocybin is exceedingly safe. There's the lethality and the toxicity level of psilocybin is minimal. Six milligrams to 25 milligrams is what we usually give for sort of these psychedelic research product protocols. And you need about 6,000 milligrams for this to be even remotely lethal. That's about 10 pounds of dried mushroom or 35 pounds of fresh mushroom. So physiologically, it's not toxic. So an ER doctor that sees you that might, you, you might have had too much mushroom is not going to worry about your physiology. They may look at your blood pressure or your heart rate because this does transiently increase but goes down once the uh, drug is metabolized. The uh, psilocybin also binds to a, the serotonin receptor and may cause some vasoconstriction in parts of the arteries, but these are sort of theoretical concerns. So physiologically, pretty safe. Now, psilocybin with lithium, not safe. It increases the chances for having seizures, so we need to be very concerned about people that might use mushrooms or un undergo psilocybin or other psych uh, classical psychedelics uh, and mixing certain medications. Um, so that's the safety component uh, physiologically. When we think about dependence and abuse, psilocybin is not an addictive drug in the classical sense. It does, doesn't have any reward and reinforcing properties that most drugs do. They, you know, there's no euphoria that's so, so, well, there is some euphoria, euphoria that people may experience, but it's not reinforcing enough that people want to use this. Uh, there's no cravings for uh, psilocybin, so people minimally abuse these medications. And the receptors are down-regulated over a period of time, so the more you use it, the less effect you have. So I usually tell people I'm not too concerned about people becoming addicted to psilocybin. Now let's shift our gear to psychological concerns. This is where I get concerned about people undergoing an experience because these medicines can create uh, very altered experiences in your consciousness. Perceptual disturbances, it may uncover material that's repressed that might float to the surface, which may be really uncomfortable for people. So you may experience anxiety or depression. A survey that came out, that came out a few years ago looking at 2,000 people that had uncomfortable trips. Now these are people that you know, did the survey and had uncomfortable or disturbing trips. 10% said that they had put themselves or others in, at risk, and about 14% of them said that they had persisting psychological problems even six months after the, the, um, the, the trip. So um, I'm more concerned about the psychological aspects. Are we, I think of, we t typically think of set and setting, but I'm, I'm beginning to think that we should screen patients first, 
put them in the uh, appropriate mindset, have an appropriate setting, and then have the appropriate support afterwards. So that may be integration. So the four S's is how I think about safety at this point. Thank you for that. All right, the next question is for you, Manoj. Um, so what do the latest MDMA phase three study results show and why are these results significant, both clinically and in the development of other psychedelic therapies? Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Big Psych, for holding this event and allowing me to participate in this panel. Uh, MDMA has made a lot of news over this last year. It's um, you know on the cusp of approval from the FDA probably in the next year and a half or so. And the reason being this last phase uh, study, so in the clinical research, you need to complete three different phases. The last phase demonstrates, should de um, demonstrate safety and efficacy. Um, and MDMA assisted psychotherapy came through in this first phase three study. Um, MDMA in particular, uh, they used the indication for uh, PTSD to treat with it. Um, because MDMA has been shown to reduce activity in the amygdala, which is sort of the fear processing part of your brain. And paradoxically, it actually increases communication um, with the hippocampus, which is uh, um, the memory consolidation part of your brain. So um, you can just think of it as reduces fear, but reconsolidates your memories, which is exactly what you need to treat people with PTSD. Um, this phase study, it was uh, three different countries, um, 15 different sites, 90 participants, uh, 45, uh, 46 of them were, uh, received the actual MDMA uh, treatment, um, 44 received a placebo. Um, it was given over the course of uh, 12 different weeks, weeks, so each um, person got three different sessions along with preparation and integration afterwards. Um, the results are pretty uh, profound, actually. The, the MDMA treatment arm, um, it was shown that 67% of them no longer met diagnosis for PTSD versus 32% that received the inactive placebo. So pretty profound. Um, another endpoint that they studied was um, reduction in just PTSD symptoms, at least a 10-point reduction in the scale they used. And 33% uh, of the MDMA tr um, group had a reduction that large uh, versus only 5% of the placebo. So pretty significant findings. Um, in addition, they did another scoring system that looked at just overall disability. And it showed that uh, functional disability, things with work, with life, your family. And uh, it showed that MDMA had a vast improvement on that as well. Um, and then another score that they looked at was depression, and MDMA had significant benefits there as well. Um, so overall, when you look at it, you know, there's a lot of strengths to come out with it. Um, you know, the strengths that primarily I look at is the study design. Um, the, you know, they had statistical validity to what they were looking at. Um, they had a you know, fairly good representation in terms of the people um, that were in it um, at three, in three different countries. Um, however, when you, you dig down into it, you know, there is some uh, misrepresentation of people in it. The active uh, treatment arm, 86% of the active arm were, were white people. Um, and there were only two black persons in the entire study, and they were both in the placebo arm. Um, the side effects were pretty rare. Um, in, in general, the things that people think connect with MDMA are, you know, uh, hyperthermia, which is, you know, a significant increase in the, your body temperature, um, and uh, things like, uh, you know, profuse sweating, uh, nausea, that sort of thing. Uh, the MDMA group had very minor symptoms. Uh, the two people had a temperature of greater than 100. Um, and, but no one had any you know, seizure activity, no one had some dehydration, it was fairly well controlled. Um, there's some suspected cardiovascular um, side effects with it, but the, there was only two cardiovascular events, it was, it was actually the same person, and it was heart palpitations for someone that had an underlying heart condition. Um, so overall, when you look at safety and you look at efficacy, everything looks great. Um, in particular, what you look at um, is how does it compare to current medications and treatment for these conditions? And so there's two FDA-approved medications, sertraline and paroxetine. And if you look at their studies, um, they are about 40 to 60% response rate. But in particular, 
you look at a statistic um, that compares the treatment versus the placebo, and the MDMA therapy was about three times more effective compared to paroxetine or sertraline, and about two times more effective than sertraline. So significant improvements, and that's not even including the fact that you don't have to be on a medication every day, and that we don't actually know what the long-term effects of being on SSRI is. The, the longest, the best studies on SSRIs, um, the longest studies of any of those have only been two years. So uh, we, we don't even know what, you know, the effects of them from long-term are. So all in all, it's, uh, it's excellent. Um, and so basically, what does that mean for you guys? What does it mean for the general population seeking these treatments? Um, so it needs to go through another phase three trial, which is underway right now. Um, and then after that, it goes through FDA re review process. And they look at the data, they look at the efficacy, and they say, well, how does this translate to people? And you know, at the same time, we have to look at it and say, there were still only 90 people and the average age was about 40 um, in these study populations. So we got to be able to generalize these results to the greater population, and how do we translate that safely? Um, so what it looks like, and I've, I'm in discussion uh, with MAPS scientific team, they actually kind of look at our clinic right now as being a blueprint for what these MDMA-assisted psychotherapy clinics are going to look like. Um, in fact, uh, my partner is the first MDMA-assisted psychotherapist trained by MAPS in the state of Minnesota, and we have four other therapists that um, will start the training here in the fall. Um, so I can say with some degree of certainty that even MAPS doesn't even know what this is actually going to look like. But we do have some general ideas um, that they will be in facilities sort of like ours with maybe a one-person team, a therapist there in the room with you. Um, right now they have two people in the room, which could be price prohibitive for a lot of people, um, but that's not set in stone yet, so we, we still don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but overall, it looks like we're on track for probably 2023 um, FDA approval process. Thank you. All right, so the next question is for Renji. Um, can you speak on some of the mechanisms of psilocybin particularly, and how do we currently think these chemicals affect the brain? So. Uh, over the past few years, and really since 2006, we have not really understood how uh, the classical psychedelics work, but I'll try and boil it down to a few points here. Um, and this is a lot of this has, is based on Robin Carhart Harris's work in the, the brain and tropic hypothesis and uh, hierarchical predictive coding and things like, things like that that I don't under well understand. Uh, and not a lot of people do, but there's really good data that supports these ideas. So essentially, when we th think about psilocybin, it's part of the classical psychedelics. Um, and the classical psychedelics include things like LSD, which was uh, discovered by Albert Hoffman in 1943, dimethyltryptamine, which is one of the constituents in the ayahuasca brew, uh, and then psilocybin, which is the molecule in uh, the psilocybe cubensis and psilocybe species fungi and other fungi. Um, and these three classical psychedelics, if I may use that, uh, have a very similar structure. Their chemical backbone looks exactly the same. And that chemical backbone also looks exactly like serotonin's chemical backbone. So the classical psychedelics have a very similar chemical backbone to serotonin. So naturally, they would bind to the serotonin receptor, but not just any serotonin receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor or the 5-HT2A receptor. So it's very sticky. These, these substances, psilocybin, it's very sticky for these particular receptors, uh, this 5-HT2A receptor. Uh, and these receptors are located in parts of the brain um, uh, in very highly processed uh, or areas of the brain that um, uh, process information in a hierarchical structure, a structure called the default mode network. And the default mode network isn't just one blob in the brain. There's sort of, sort of series of structures, the posterior cingulate cortex, the medial uh, prefrontal cortex, but they're anatomically and functionally integrated. Um, so what does the default mode network do? It is sort of on when we're awake and we're conscious. We're not really taking in information from the outside world, but just sort of daydreaming about ourselves, maybe thinking about how we relate to ourselves, how we may see ourselves in the future, how we may see ourselves in the past, and, uh, emotional reflection. Some people call it the seat of the ego. But the default mode network also, apart from sort of having that function and other, and other functions, 
uh, tends to also, in our normal waking experience, the non-psychedelic experience, constrain lower areas of the brain. And these are the medial temporal lobes that include the amygdala, the parahippocampus, and the hippocampus. So it sort of deactivates or sort of at least um, alters the effects of these other lower areas of the brain that also process information, but in a different way. So when psychedelics bind to the 5-HT2A receptor, the default mode network, these structures, which are typically on when we're awake and conscious, becomes quiet very much quiet so and when that happens those areas that were constrained by the default mode network these lower areas of the brain are now activated in ways that were not uh, activated when the default mode network was working and what happens is this brain state this non-ordinary state of consciousness altered state of consciousness is experienced as having different perceptual experiences visual disturbances um, emotional ability where you may have euphoria or happiness or sadness there's a sort of vacillation between emotions there's vacillation between cognitions but there's a hyper associated state because these areas that were constrained can now sort of play freely in, in, a, in, a, in a way that it wasn't before the um, with the default mode network um, and, and the brain tends to be very flexible, cognitively flexible, and less rigid in these psychedelic states as opposed to our current waking state where things are very logical, analytical, and rigid, and it should be. You don't want to live your life in a psychedelic state because you wouldn't do a good job of navigating the world that way. So when the psychedelics sort of uh, are metabolized off of the default mode network, um, it's business as usual. So. That's kind of how it works. That's how we think it works, but these are working hypotheses, but there's also very good evidence. And I think this study that, and I won't spend too much details on it, but this study is sort of a mechanistic, stu the, the study that Jessica and I are on um, uh, is a mechanistic study trying to look essentially under the hood. You know, what is, how is this actually working? Awesome, thank you. All right, um, so I wanna get more of like a kind of clinical perspective from both of you, especially as this stuff is coming online. Um, and this question is gonna be for both of you. Um, so it seems, and, and, and Manoj, this is one of your questions, but I think it would be good to hear um, both of your perspective on this. And what are the fixed ideas of mainstream medicine that have led to blind spots in harnessing the power of psychedelics that have been demonstrated in recent clinical trials? So, sure. so I'm a clinician trained in Western medicine, as is Raji, and I understand that mental health care has not met the needs of the people. You know, for healthcare and mental health, our job is to meet the demands of the populations we serve. And with the rising rates of suicide and depression in this country, um, we certainly have not met it. Um, so I, I think that when we look at psychedelic medicine, we should look at it as not a medicalization of psychedelics, but really the opposite, that traditional medicine is moving toward more this philosophical and Eastern type medicine. Um, and the way I see it right now, there, there are some blind spots of what happened. It's not, it's not been seamless and I don't, I don't expect it to be, but um, the few things that came to my mind and I'm trying to focus my attention to to help remedy, um, one of them is um, the privileging of the commercialization driven by the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, that and dismissing non-ordinary st states of consciousness. Um, if you look at some of these public um, corporations um, that are developing psychedelics, one of the things they're trying to do is develop a psychedelic that doesn't provide a psychedelic experience. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, it just goes back to the, you know, the neuroplasticity, synaptogenesis, these type of, you know, really uh, esoteric um, scientific terms that um, don't mean anything to people. Um, so I think that's a big problem. Um, overlooking the set and setting and the therapeutic framework is another one. You know, like I said, uh, the study that I just talked about, that's, it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. It's not giving just MDMA and see what happens. It's the whole process. Um, it's, it doesn't come just individually. Um, I think fetishizing, I like, you know, I'm a doctor. I like looking at fancy imaging, you know, it's, I think it's fun. And, but fetishizing the, these functional MRIs and these um, really colorful looking images. Uh, that's a problem with uh, doctors in particular. Um, I, I just, I think that 
we, um, uh, we, we don't know enough about the imaging. It tells us some things, you know, it tells us that there's lots of oxygen being used in this area and that's this area might be indicative of something, but still an indirect measurement. Um, and I think just, you know, peripheralizing psychological mechanisms, I think that's uh, another thing, you know, I, we put so much emphasis in my company about um, integration and that the, there's psychological theories that um, we try to capitalize on by using the medicine as a mediator, as a facilitator. Um, and I think that's where the sweet spot is going to be in this field. That's a really good question. Um, medicine is complex and it's broken to a degree and we all know it. <laughs> um, and psychiatry and psychology um, in particular, mostly because there's not enough of us and the medicines are just not as good as we would like it to be. You just heard Manoj saying that, you know, paroxetine, and I think he said sertraline, um, they're effective. I mean, these medicines, there are good medica medicines out there, but for people that have very difficult treatment-resistant depression, uh, there are not a lot of options. And I, um, I don't see the medical community being as enthusiastic as they could be with psychedelics, and they should be. But that's the process that we're doing right now. Um, I, I, do, I don't want to dismiss that the work that we do in getting this data is, shouldn't be ignored. Because the only way to get to physicians and the people that make decisions uh, on these sort of things to, let's say, approve MDMA or um, psilocybin is to convince them. And in order to convince them, we need to have really good data we need to make sure that we're doing things in a way that make peop that keep people very safe. This is one of the reasons why there are two people in an MDMA room because that person that is undergoing either psilocybin or MDMA, they're probably in their most vulnerable state. And if you don't have two people in the room that is imbuing and communicating safety to that person, they're the wrong sitter. So we have to have very strict models of uh, and standards for how we um, sort of um, you know provide this. I think it's going to be complicated. I don't think anyone has an answer for this. Maps doesn't really have an answer for this, um, but I think we should continue to push for community advocacy. But I think we should also support the research that is you know that's already undergoing, so that we have we can have a seat at the table and be able to convince the people that make these decisions to do the right thing. Thank you. All right, so I want to be mindful of time. I know we have to be out of here by four. Um, so I do want to open it up to some questions from the audience, if anybody has any uh, questions for either Renji or Manoj or myself. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, right here in the middle. My, just the research in general? If, if we had unlimited money to be able to sort of do our studies, how would we recalibrate our study? Yeah. Um, I'm going to let Manoj take that one before I think about that. It, it's complicated because we're living in a medical industrial complex, right? And so this is one of the things. I mean, I don't know how MDMA will be. You, people are going to go into this, and the number of hours that you have to do to get this, the, the training and then to, do, to have sitters there for six, eight hours, it's going to be difficult. However, um, I think we need to convince people that... Um, these are life-saving therapies. These are potentially life-saving therapies. 67% of people had remission in the MDMA studies. How many suicides have to you know, occur before we you know, look at those numbers and say we need to do this? If we can prioritize that mental health and things like clinical depression or anxiety or PTSD or suicidality is as important as cancer people might start listening. Um, um, 
one thing I will say about the treatment of MDMA and how it's going to happen is that it's probably not going to be two sitters in the room. They'll probably have one um, therapist in the room with a guy floating around. So I think it's going to make it a lot more accessible that way. So like in our clinic, I'll be the float that just goes from room to room um, with the therapist there in it. Um, the other thing is they're looking at is um, uh, having group sessions for it. So you can split the cost. Everybody that's in the room will be at you know, some issue that, at the same intersectionality. Um, and the one thing I will say is that, you know, I talk to insurance companies and I'm, I'm trying to work with other self-insured entities. And the, the thing about it is that the psychedelic renaissance, yes, it's been shown great for these, these disease states. Um, but the reason that it's going to be FDA approved doesn't really have anything to do so much as how well it's treating people. It's really because, and I don't want to sound too cynical, but it's really because um, there's an existential crisis in this country, in this world. You know, uh, the leading cause of depression, of uh, disability in the world is uh, is suicide and depression. So I, I really think that this is what's going to push it all, and eventually the money's going to come with it. Great, thank you. All right, so we want to end early. We do have to be out of this place by 4 p.m. So thank you all so much for attending, um, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. <laughs>